in Taiwan, I would like to bring Taiwan more mm -hmm. into the discussion between EU and China. Mm -hmm. It's a difficult one to have. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, thank you for having taking time to meet mm -hmm. me. And I really look forward to our conversation with, yeah. with, with your views. Sure, let's um, get started. Yeah. So, as you could see in my card, I also mm -hmm. work for 9-9, um, yeah. which is mm -hmm. a digital platform that covers EU, like, that aims at connecting Europe with democracies in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Taiwan is one of our major focus. Mm -hmm. And while I am here, I am trying to connect us more, also to help Europeans get a better understanding of Taiwan. Uh, and the uh, and the regional dynamics, and also hopefully contribute to Taiwanese mm -hmm. scholars or experts or think tankers mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and civil society mm -hmm. to understand Europe better. Yeah. Um, so um, I I sent my questions. I don't know. Maybe we can stick to those more or less. It, it doesn't. Hey, it's it fine. It's fine. I I I'm, I'm fine either way. I I got the questions, but okay. feel free to reorder, expand. Uh, yes. Rotate, translate, uh, scale, <laughs> <laughs> however you wish. Thank you. So I would first of all be interested in you sure. and in, in your work sure. and uh, as a minister, digital minister yes. in, in charge of social innovation. Mm -hmm. I think already the, your title mm -hmm. is, has four different um, elements in it. And if you could expand... Mm, it's not even my full title. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to reduce it to... Yeah, but, but it's also open government, youth mm, engagement. Of course. Yeah. Yes, uh -huh. all of that. So yeah. if you could uh -huh. if you could expand on how you see your role as a mm -hmm. digital minister in charge of social mm -hmm. innovation mm -hmm. and much and, more. And much more. <laughs> indeed. Uh -huh. And it's been four years now, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. And with this pandemic happening and as we see the global dynamics around that, how do you see this role and what are you your ambitions mm -hmm. in in the near future mm -hmm. with with everything that you were um, provided as mm -hmm. tools mm -hmm. and your capacity to mm -hmm. innovate beyond that well my ambition is very plain on my card it says taiwan can help <laughs> and taiwan is helping <laughs> yes and taiwan is helping uh, <coughs> and i've had that card for the past three years now mm -hmm. uh, except the backside changes every year because uh, the MOFA uh, designates um, different uh, priorities. So it, it used to look like this on the first year, oh, okay. um, which is a focus, I think, more on um, the uh, sustainability of circular economy mm -hmm. and the agricultural technologies that Taiwan is, of course, very uh, well known. Uh, and the next year's card <laughs> focus on this, like collecting card game. Right? <laughs> I'll keep them all. Right, focus on the uh, ocean, mm. uh, like marine debris management, plastic waste management, and also climate change uh, mitigation. Mm -hmm. So that's the two colors, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and um, understandably, though, uh, this year we focus far more, um, not only on health, uh, but also on pretty much everything. It's like a kaleidoscope. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the design is more like a kaleidoscope mm -hmm. this year, which is the, the one I just gave you, <laughs> um, which means that in all and each of the 17 global goals, um, we're now much more confident that we can help and, and we are helping. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is about expanding Taiwan's traditional international role, uh, whereas previously, as I mentioned, it was about agriculture technology, it's about marine debris, circular economy, climate change mitigation, but that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. um, but <clears throat> nowadays, <clears throat> we also expand to other SDGs, including the 16th, like mm -hmm. open government um, and like digital governance, uh, the 17th. Uh, which is what everybody is talking about now is the data norms. Uh, that's the 17s. Um, broadband as human rights. That's the nice. Uh, and so on. And so, um, I would say that we're going, uh, not only about like bilateral, um, relationships that's focused on mutual aid. Uh, and in Taiwan's case, mostly about, uh, the countries that are more resemble like us, but 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, but nowadays with countries that resemble us, but maybe three years in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's a very different configuration. And I think digital helps uh, not only mutual accountability, but also the very important thing about norm shaping, um, which is also a core EU concern uh, about how to make 
the chapter in the GDPR that nobody understands the joint data controllership, mm-hmm. how to actually make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, there's various pro- propositions like data unions, data trust, data collisions, um, um, data cooperatives, I can say maybe 10 more. <laughs> but the, the core idea is how, how not to fall to authoritarian intelligence on one side and to surveillance capitalism on the other. And, and that we can also help. So, mm-hmm. so that's my ambition, uh, mm-hmm. but it's, I think it's also an ambition for the EU as well. Yes, yeah. indeed. The norm shaping mm-hmm. is at the core of mm-hmm. the EU's identity as a normative mm-hmm. power. Yes. And this has been challenged for quite a while, especially mm-hmm. with China's mm-hmm. increasing aspirations or ambitions mm-hmm. to shape norms themselves. But, but also surveillance capitalists increasing right. ambition. So, so so these two like um, I often say it's like a Eurasian plate on one side and the Philippine Sea plate on mm-hmm. the other and they bump into each other mm-hmm. and we experience earthquakes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so let's talk about the Taiwan model yeah, sure. in that context. Okay. Um, not only in Europe but worldwide mm-hmm. I think Taiwan is Mm -hmm. getting more and more attention because um, of this successful uh, way of containing the virus and beyond not just domestically doing such a great job to protect the health Mm -hmm. of the people Mm -hmm. but to help others and you've seen in I think it was in April that our high representative uh, or actually not not high representative Mm -hmm. but the um, president of the the president yes yes she also Uh from the alliance she Uh Tweeted that she yeah, helps I saw the tweet. yes. uh, Taiwan for the millions mm-hmm. of masks that we've mm-hmm. received. Mm-hmm. So I think it is going to be crucial for mm-hmm. the future mm-hmm. how to maintain the momentum mm-hmm. and how the Taiwan model can mm-hmm. actually go beyond the global health mm-hmm. component. Because the way I see the Taiwan model as such, um, I see a lot of elements to it. And you've already discussed some of the the elements. I also mm-hmm. would like to talk about the public trust element mm-hmm. and also how you see the Taiwan model to be able to become like mm-hmm. a soft power tool mm-hmm. for, for Taiwan. Yeah, we, we didn't send those masks, yeah. but, <laughs> but that's part of the soft power too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, that mm-hmm. would be the, the, the mm-hmm. if you could maybe speak a little bit about the Taiwan model mm-hmm. in in the context of uh, fighting the virus, mm-hmm. because I think that's at the moment, as you see what is mm-hmm. happening in Europe, mm-hmm. in, in Belgium, it is mm-hmm. it, it is heartbreaking for the people, but also in a way shameful, I think, for democracies mm-hmm. to fail um, at such a scale. So if you could um, tell me how you think mm-hmm. Taiwan can promote the innovations mm-hmm. in the Taiwan mm-hmm. model and describe the model and maybe identify some elements that can be picked out of the model mm-hmm. that can serve as soft power tool for mm-hmm. for Taiwan. Sure. Well, you, you mentioned the virus, but there's two virus simultaneously. There's virus of the body, which is SARS 2.0, and there's virus of the mind, uh, which is the infodemic conspiracy theories and so on. Um, and these two are intertwined. When people um, buy into conspiracy theories, um, then they become less capable of acting in the way that um, helps the scientific knowledge that could prevent the epidemic uh, in the first place. On the other hand, if the government sees the citizen as not trustworthy, maybe because they buy into conspiracy theories uh, and impose a very stringent Top down, lock down, take down, shut down <laughs> procedures, um, then uh, that actually makes the conspiracy theory uh, even louder mm-hmm. because people understandably see that this is a move toward grabbing state power mm-hmm. and people would rebel uh, for anything that's top down or new data collection that violates the norm before the pandemic and things like that. So I'm, I'm just saying these two have this vicious cycle uh, mm-hmm. dynamic going on. Um, and uh, underlying both uh, in the Taiwan model is a idea that if the government trusts the citizens, then there is no false dilemma between freedom and human right on one side and public health, either mental or physical, mm-hmm. on the other side. Mm-hmm. This false dilemma only appears if the state wants to do everything. 
Mm. Um, if we understand, for example, uh, in early February, we understood that if three quarter of people wear the mask and wash their hands, then the virus will not replicate. Uh, the R value will be under one. And now you see, of course, these everywhere. <laughs> but, but that's not because of, of any top down measure. It is because we made sure that the acute spokesdoc, the Zong Chai, um, explains the science. Uh, and in a way that incentivizes people um, based on the idea that you wear the mask to protect yourself against your own unwashed hands, mm -hmm. which is an entirely individualistic mm -hmm. incentive and thereby easier to spread mm -hmm. than the collectivist incentive. Like you do this to avoid a fine or you do this to respect your elders, which is very difficult to fly, right? Uh, and so um, just getting the incentives right be uh, very iterative, like anyone calling 1922 gets the science explained to them in a very empathetic way. Mm -hmm. And their ideas, if new, uh, they can be amplified on the very next day's Central Epidemic Common Sense uh, uh, live stream. And so the fast iteration enables collective intelligence. The fair distribution enables this mutual accountability mm -hmm. that people queuing in line can take uh, into account the mask availability map so that people queue in before them when they swipe their national health insurance card and get nine or ten masks. The people queuing after them can indeed see that system is working uh, without any top-down surveillance or control. Uh, and finally, it's fun. There's nothing fun about COVID, yeah. but there's everything fun about, for example, this cute spokes dog, yeah. our head of the cabinet um, showing his bottoms and say that it doesn't pay to stockpile, um, saying that there's a lot of instant noodles, buy as much as you want, but don't forget your vegetables. Uh, and, and all this uh, put in stop to conspiracy theories and panic buying. Um, and that really, really worked. And so that's called humor over rumor. And I think all these individual elements are easy to adapt uh, in other jurisdictions. So telemodel is not a kind of one size fits all thing. It's rather a, a a very gentle idea that if government trusts the citizens more, citizens can innovate better than government. And then we apply it in various ways, fast, fair, and fun. Mm. Mm. The, speaking about Europe and Taiwan, you said you you had a quick look at the piece that I, oh, yeah, I, I wrote and uh, uh, hey, hey, not a quick look. <laughs> <laughs> I read it quite carefully. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I mm. I, I also published um, a similar article in the Taiwan, the Taipei Times. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. that, but that was um, about a month or two months ago. Okay. Uh, we worked together with other fellows in in the MOFA um, fellowship. Uh, program and we really advocate for a stronger look at uh, at Taiwan and also for example Europe and India to work together uh, to embrace Taiwan um, with Taiwan's rise, uh, profile on the rise and having read my article mm -hmm. and also being so well informed about global dynamics mm -hmm. and global uh, sentiment mm -hmm. on China's assertiveness, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the European context. Mm -hmm. And since we speak about infodemic and um, conspiracy theory, I mm -hmm. think this is one of the elements that has contributed to um, a sharp rise in European minds mm -hmm. on the implications of such an increased presence of Chinese actors and state-owned mm -hmm. enterprises, state-backed actors in, on our soil. Because with, you know, in the past 10 years, Europe has had a rough time, especially after 2008 financial mm -hmm. crisis. And then you've seen the migration crisis uh, and also integration, Brexit, so many things uh, that has sharpened divisions and mm -hmm. deepened divisions within uh, European countries, but also gave China a, almost an opportunity to step in. And they were very skillful in further divide, you know, in recognizing the financial problems, mm -hmm. but also political crisis and identity crisis. So in all, in, in all that uh, context, with um, such a, you know, with China's influence rising in Europe, we've also established um, some 
very interesting tools to to fight against misinformation and disinformation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also I've to explain. read uh, EU versus disinfo. Exactly. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's one. And then I, I've done, because I'm not an expert in this uh-huh. field, uh-huh. but I've done some, some research on uh-huh. um, our programs and you know we have the mm-hmm. East Strat Com yes. mm-hmm. in the external action service mm-hmm. and that's really focusing on Russia's yes. attempts to undermine us mm-hmm. uh, but we also have the European Digital Media Observatory mm-hmm. project yes. mm-hmm. which is a hub for fact checkers and academics um, and we have the 2018 mm-hmm. EU action plan against this information yeah. so lots of different tools and I think this is um, a good e- indication that we are converging so do you think this could be an area that europe could learn more from from taiwan yeah definitely Uh Mm -hmm. yes and in what ways do you see how would you assess our our approach to taiwan at the moment Mm -hmm. as a european approach knowing that europe is is more of a the european union is not a country but 27 countries and it's much more difficult Mm -hmm. to work with much more complex so how do you see where do you see that we could work closer together you mean at the eu at the short term or in the long term like us switching to euro (laughs) (laughs) that would be an interesting and innovative uh, idea short term medium term long term Uh okay Mm, people to people beyond health Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all these elements Mm -hmm. yeah um i I wasn't entirely joking about switching to europe though um because uh i I do see that our data norms are very compatible and you probably would struggle to find a more european data norm in this part of indo-pacific Mm. Um, and so, although of course the fiat probably cannot be converted to euro mm. anytime soon, uh, but uh, when we're working on digital currencies, that is to say digital fiat, um, then the norm around, for example, uh, in Taiwan, uh, our central bank mm. it, is planning um, a research on exactly that, a digital fiat. Mm. Uh, and they uh, designed the system. I think one of the design criteria is that unless you're wiring like money laundering level of a lot of money, uh, all transactions must be anonymous, just like cash. Mm. Uh, but you will not find that norm, um, not only in PRC, yeah. but, but in many nearby Indo-Pacific regions, because they do think that more state intelligence is a good thing mm-hmm. uh, and not instrumental it is a net good thing um, like core value but i would easily imagine that from the european single economy uh, nobody wants uh, the central digital fiat mm-hmm. to know all the shopping habits mm-hmm. of all european citizens uh, and so um, i think we're, our systems are compatible mm-hmm. and although we may not call it euro, euro if the algorithmic governance uh, is the same principle, then it might as well be compatible, uh, like interchangeable. Um, so I think it's a it's a very concrete thing uh, we can work on, mm-hmm. um, and it also has uh, very similar applications when it comes to this info. Um, in Taiwan, we look at the fact checking organizations. We make sure that we empower them. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have this idea called social sector, Mm -hmm. which is gaining currency in EU as well. Um, Of course, various EU countries use different terms. Some say civil society organizations and so on, which is a banned term in PRC, by the way. (laughs) You can't even say civil society organizations. But, But the empowerment of social sector really is at the core of the Taiwan counter disinformation playbook. Because if we say that the state can take down anything, hate speech, you name it, then the journalists and fact checkers have no, um, no way to expand their reach on that particular regard. Mm-hmm. Because then it will be something between the surveillance capitalists and the state. Mm-hmm. It will be a kind of uh, bargain, right? But then the social sector will be less empowered if we adopted such a model. 
But instead, we say no. The social sector has higher legitimacy,、mm -hmm. and our playbook is just to, I don't know, make their fact checking fun,、mm -hmm. uh, and amplify their voices. But at the end of the day, is the Taiwan Fact Check Center. It is the Michael Penn. It is Cofax. It's people in the social sector, including middle schoolers and primary schoolers. Fact checking each and every sentence in our presidential debate and forum,、yeah. uh, and because they are longer lasting than any four-year government,、mm -hmm. and they are more trustworthy than any surveillance capitalist,、mm -hmm. uh, and so this empowerment、uh, of the not only research and academia but also the social sector,、mm -hmm. including very young people,、um, is at the core. So、uh, a framework about digital competence, not literacy. About media competence, not literacy, meaning that people are no longer just receivers but co-producers、uh, of、um, epistemic input.、Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is、uh, something that EU and Taiwan、mm -hmm. has a lot、uh, in common, and in fact, we actually do learn from one another. For example, when it comes to citizen consultation, our、uh, e-petition website. Is a carbon copy、mm -hmm. of the、um, Better Reykjavik、uh, from Iceland,、mm -hmm. uh, and our participatory budget portal、um, learned a lot、uh, from the Barcelona and the Madrid、uh, models,、uh, and our digital consultation platform V Taiwan、uh, learned a <coughs> learned a lot from the digital、uh, Republic Numeric、uh, from the the、uh, French government. Uh, and also their like national consultations and so on.、Uh, we also watch very closely and so on. So there's a natural affinity of empowering the social sector through co-creation against the infodemic.、Mm. I think this is really interesting because where I struggle most is when people ask me. Also, you say Europe and Taiwan should cooperate more. How?、Mm -hmm. Like, give us exactly. Your suggestions,、mm -hmm. because you know Europe and China relations, it's business as usual. European countries do not want to engage openly with Taiwan、mm -hmm. because they fear、mm -hmm. that there will be consequences to their. You mean on democratic consultation, like the PRC has better democratic consultation tools <laughs> they want to sell? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, no, no. But that's what I'm trying to say.、Yeah. That. Exactly、uh -huh. as you point out,、uh -huh. that this element is、uh -huh. at the core、uh -huh. of the Taiwan model,、uh -huh. and we are natural partners.、Uh -huh. So European on the European side, because we've already openly said that Russia and China are the biggest source of disinformation、mm -hmm. throughout the pandemic.、Mm -hmm. We we is、um, in June, I think, this year we. Put this report out on a European level that was backed by your、mm -hmm. mem member states, and this was seen as a revolutionary、um, approach because never before have we said that China is also the major source. About Russia, we've said that before. You know, Russia, our relations with Russia and China are different for obvious reasons: the proximity,、uh, you know, the the Baltic states and Poland, you know, feel、mm -hmm. Russia's breathing、mm -hmm. on their neck on a on a daily basis. So. Relations are different, but I think what I now that I'm inspired by is your 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 views on on the、mm -hmm. misinformation, disinformation counter、mm -hmm. countering that how we we should work more closely、mm -hmm. together on that front. I think、mm -hmm. I think that's one very good、mm -hmm. good element, and also the the trust as you describe the. For, so the people feel that it's not the government that it's fact checking, but it's in, government empowering、exactly. them to fact check、mm -hmm. themselves.、Mm -hmm. Because in Europe, also I don't know how it is in in Taiwan in in the public mind、mm -hmm. on the, on in the public mind of the people of the on the street whether they really understand、mm -hmm. the nuances of this information、mm -hmm. and the implications. Because I think、mm -hmm. in Europe this is not yet clear. Like, yeah, well, because you're you're subject to it later than we are. Of course,、right? uh, the the PRC has been saying for decades that、mm. they can take care of Taiwan's twenty three million people's、mm. health in the World Health Organization, and and that's disinformation. Right, <laughs> and we've been subject to that in in decades. And so、uh, I, my point is that、uh, it's not just about the vaccination of this inf against disinformation. Like getting the cute spokes dogs、uh, into everybody's、yeah. mind, or recently I also、um, role played, close played the animal. But anyway,、uh, so it's not just about the vaccination.、Uh, it's also about the testing. That's the fact checking. 
-hmm. and it's also about the cure. Uh, and that is the kind of um, digital tools that we work with the global uh, platform economy provider, such as Facebook, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that there is, for example, real-time open data when it comes to election-related social and political targeted advertisements. And you really need to nip it in the bud. You, you really need to say, you know, foreign people just should not make precision advertisements during our election season. Uh, and, and they also conformed uh, starting last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the vaccination, the testing and the cure, I think are all important and we are happy to share uh, just as we shared the biological version of vaccination, testing and cure. Mm -hmm. So maybe my next piece that I write while I'm here should be to elaborate a little bit more on mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on. Because I think in Europe, people don't really understand. We just simply they don't know mm -hmm. how much and in what ways Taiwan, mm -hmm. in a collaborative approach between right. the government and civil mm -hmm. society, mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. fights disinformation. Yes. Uh -huh. So I would really love to, mm -hmm. you know, on myself mm -hmm. to uh, to write more about sure. this sure, for sure. the European the audience. Infodemiology. <laughs> yeah. <'cause> yes. <laughs> we also use the infodemic. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Term. Mm -hmm. So the um, high representative Joseph Borrell, uh, he was quite vocal on the need to fight against this information. And uh, you are f familiar with the battle of narratives, yes. as after the Chinese leadership uh, really sent all the, the help to, to Italy. Uh, and they tried to prove that it is not a democratic governance that can successfully fight the virus, but it is their strong authoritarian response. This is why we also say that China is a systemic rival, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because they try to put forward uh, an alternative model of governance. Mm -hmm. So I think that makes us even makes it even more urgent that we work with democratic countries as Taiwan in the region, mm -hmm. because Europe remains a distant actor. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we understand that the United States mm -hmm. is Taiwan's number one and most important mm -hmm. um, ally. We also <clears throat> are happy to see that President Tsai's mm -hmm. ambition, aspiration, and not only, but in real terms, the administration is looking at uh, reinforcing ties with the mm -hmm. Southeast Asian countries in the new Southbound mm -hmm. policy. And we understand that she focuses on you know people to people uh, first but beyond that as well and india is getting more attention but for that reason i think this is the moment that we push from a european perspective mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i hope that I, whatever europeans do on the ground such as myself to to give more visibility <coughs> i would love <coughs> it if if, uh, if we could maybe think about this in the future, how we could, or you know, your voice mm -hmm. has such weight mm -hmm. in in Taiwanese civil social sector, mm -hmm. as you call it. Thank and, you. <laughs> yes. I like that. I like that term. Uh, and I would be so so appreciative if mm -hmm. we could, if you could maybe mm -hmm. bring more Europe in the in the discussion, Definitely. especially mm -hmm. especially as we just discussed mm -hmm. this infodemic, fighting the infodemic, mm -hmm. not just the, the virus as such, but the information given China's implications of you know influence in Europe. So maybe we can maybe we can tweet about this. Yeah we, we we could we could uh, and meeting. there's plenty of material. Mm -hmm. Joe has it all right. There was a early September meeting called Digital Democracy where Europe can learn from Taiwan, which is on YouTube and also a transcript uh, mm -hmm. hosted by Dominic uh, uh, and also um, there's of course Taiwan's own counter disinformation playbook mm -hmm. uh, it's in English uh, so uh, I can also get your copy and I wrote a blog uh, about uh, like trusting the citizens uh, mm -hmm. for both the infodemic and uh, epidemic mm -hmm. so there's plenty of material to work with and I'm happy to tweet about it thank yeah. you thank you mm -hmm. I, I like it how you say you mm -hmm. don't trust the citizen because from in Europe, we always say trust the government. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't talk about how the government trusts its citizens. Mm -hmm. We always talk about not trusting the government. So I, 
not only because of the failure mm. of mm. COVID response, but I live in Belgium mm. and it is very sad to see how fragmented the country is, well, to give as a given, mm-hmm. it is a federal state. So this yeah. is this is not a, the sad part of the story, but the, the complexity of it means that you have a different plan for restrictions in place for the different regions and they overlap mm-hmm. and they clash mm-hmm. and people are just completely distrustful of, of the authorities because they say that they don't have a plan, that it's a complete mm-hmm. failure. We don't have the experience of a, of SARS or as, as mm-hmm. some Asian uh, countries have mm-hmm. had and learned from. Maybe mm-hmm. this is our SARS. Yeah, exactly, because we our municipal and central government was saying completely different thing in 2003 too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you've learned. And we've learned. That's yeah. why you have mm-hmm. a central epidemic That's right. control. That's right, yes. yes mm-hmm. the, the command center. And mm-hmm. I've, I mean, I'm a very, good example if when I go back to Europe to say that it works because first of all I could come to, mm. to Taiwan in spite of what is happening I was uh, closely monitored and I had no problem with that mm-hmm. because it was for my own good mm-hmm. and my own health yeah. and for the, the health of the, the community mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so I I have an issue with you know Europeans being so even today even after all these months mm-hmm. of dealing with a pandemic, still not wanting to wear a mask Mm -hmm. and still taking that as as something that violates their personal freedom, like in the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. With this, of course, I think we need to look deeper in Mm -hmm. why we have such a... Yeah, but but I think it also has something to do with how masks are um, advertised in Mm -hmm. the first place, Mm -hmm. right? When you say it's protecting you from your own unwashed hands, um, it first is individualistic and also it avoids all the unnecessary debates on exactly how much does it protect against the uh, respiratory uh, disease because uh, when we um, came up with this idea masks are here to protect against your own wash hands uh, the idea about asymptomatic uh, transmission about aerosol and so on all these are just being investigated it was like really early it was January um, mm-hmm. early February but nobody disputes that if you touch a surface and put uh, your face to your own hands that's a very likely vehicle of transmission and masks stops that <laughs> Uh, and then reminds you to wash your hands. Uh, and so um, the WHO at the time was saying that don't wear a mask because it can lead to a false sense of security and then you probably wouldn't wash your hands as much. Oh. Uh, and so that's the, the main problem of that. And and they're not wrong, right? It's the same research. You just interpret it in two different ways. Mm-hmm. You either say you don't trust the citizens, so don't bother with the mask. Or you say you trust the citizens, so wear a mask to remind yourself to wash your hands Mm -hmm. and we chose the later to very good effect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one side of the coin is government trusting citizens, the Mm -hmm. other side is Mm -hmm. citizens trusting Mm -hmm. the government and and this Mm -hmm. this side Mm -hmm. in Europe, as I said, Mm -hmm. is very low. In Mm -hmm. in Taiwan, it Mm -hmm. is very high. Yeah, to give no trust is to get no trust. Mm -hmm. It's it's very simple. And we also thank the people who do not trust the government. Mm -hmm. (coughs) So for example, (coughs) the quarantine measures to just talk about. <clears throat> There's many people who are okay with it, but there were 9% of people not okay with it. Mm-hmm. And so they found some uh, parliamentarians mm-hmm. who did a public hearing with, where we have no emergency state, right? So everything we do must be pre-approved by the parliament. Mm-hmm. So in the interpolation, the Department of Cybersecurity explained the digital fence very clearly and saying that after the 14 days, there is no constitutional basis for the data to be kept. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to be, you need to worry about advertisements targeting you or whatever. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and also the telecoms have the data anyway, and they're processed within the telecom, just like the earthquake and flood warnings. So again, they're not shipping the data to any commercial vendor or anything like that. And after he explained all this, uh, the approval rate grew to 94%. Oh. So 3% more people mm-hmm. understood the explanation. Mm-hmm. But we still thank the other 6% <laughs> because they keep us honest and accountable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. In Europe, people don't, they really fear about their data being mm-hmm. misused mm-hmm. By, yeah. by the government. Justifiably so. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. of course. But they, mm-hmm. and they think that the um, geolocation, 
uh, with the app, mm-hmm. they download the app. Yeah. That, but already, as you said, the telecom mm-hmm. companies already that, have right. that. Which is why we don't introduce any apps. Mm-hmm. Because the telecoms already know to a very rough degree, like 50 meters, meter radius where your phone is. Mm-hmm. It, but it doesn't need to know which room you are in, which would be a breach of privacy mm-hmm. norms. So the, the whole point is that we do not collect data that we were not already collecting before the pandemic. Mm. And then people understand, oh, um, of course, it's not very precise, but of course, that's all we need anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so just by reusing the data in a way that are pro-social, instead of asking people to wear a Bluetooth longer or something, um, with all due respect to Singaporeans, uh, anything that is introduced after the pandemic is subject to more scrutiny and for very good reason, because people did not know its security and privacy properties. So it really comes down to explaining mm-hmm. to people yes. that what you're doing is you know, transparent mm-hmm. and open, and, yeah. and the data mm-hmm. management is yeah. not revolutionary different. It's mm-hmm. actually it's the same, same. data collectors. It's exactly. processed in the same data centers. Yeah. So if you worry about, it, of course, we give an account, but it's not like that. We collect new data. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think this is another point that that is crucial in the in the Taiwan model. You know, to to really explain in an open and transparent way and to communicate because mm-hmm. having daily press conferences mm-hmm. as Taiwan has had for, yeah, for yeah. months, mm-hmm. that, that was not the case in Europe. That's you right. Know, it's, mm-hmm. it's another very important mm-hmm. um, element to, to pick out in addition mm-hmm. to, you know, for Europe. I'm, I'm speaking. Yeah, it, it, it's, yeah, I think uh, New Zealand also mm-hmm. did the same, right? They mm-hmm. also have those briefings from the Quint, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> from the five medical offices. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I'm just checking, mindful of the time, I'm uh, checking. Sure, sure. Because uh, I don't want to overstay my my welcome here. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm. So yes, we we discussed about what Europe can learn from the response, and oh yes, do you, how about Taiwanese Taiwan soft power as mm-hmm. as a concept? How do yeah. you talk? How do you see that concept in the in the post pandemic world? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, we, we we basically we just say Taiwan can help. It's mm-hmm. our Taiwan is helping. Uh, and uh, I think this is um, a lot of the idea of soft power was in contrast uh, of the kind of hard power in terms of military, right? So it's like a cultural response to a military situation. Um, but um, nowadays, when we say Taiwan can help, um, it's, it's something more. It's not just about a culture which for, for all the good that bubble tea and so on <laughs> that did for Taiwan. Um, and it, of course, probably, I, I guess, also helps because it's not innovative and tastes really good. But the point is that uh, in, in more serious topics, right, we talk about data governance, uh, open government, social nation, and so on. And all these uh, Taiwan can also help. But it, it kind of extends beyond the idea of soft power, mm-hmm. um, which is why I translate Taiwan can help to Mandarin as nuan shi li. Mm-hmm. Uh, or a, a warm power, uh, but we don't say warm power in English because it sounds like climate change. Mm-hmm. Uh, right? yeah. <laughs> okay. But but that's the idea: is the is a power uh, to help uh, and with no string attached. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think this uh, with no string attached is the main distinguishing factor because when we do open innovation, like literally every. Um, innovation that I described to you, countering the pandemic and infodemic, it only gets stronger if more people practice it. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not a rival good, right? It's a it's a communal common good, mm-hmm. uh, and so it's in our best interest uh, to relinquish all the copyright trademarks, patents, whatever uh, around it. Uh, and I think that's a defining character. So I would say that Taiwan's soft power nowadays is more defined by open innovation than any particular product or process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you see challenges to it uh, because of the, uh, or do you see more of an opportunity, of course, with, with, uh, with the pandemic unfolding? 
Uh, opportunities for sure, because open innovation thrives if more people engage in the digital commons. Mm. And the pandemic has convinced even the people who 10 or 20 years ago had a really bad experience with video conferencing to mm. re re-evaluate the digital commons and found that, oh, it's actually pretty good nowadays, mm -hmm. right? So we get to meet more senior journalists, more senior decision makers over the cyberspace simply because we can see each other more clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, if we meet face to face, we have to wear masks. Mm -hmm. But in any way, the, the, so the, the point is that the diplomatic norm has changed. It used to be uh, quite a stir uh, when I spoke through a telepresence robot mm -hmm. at UN Geneva building in the Internet Governance Forum um, to the protest of the PRC ambassador, but he did not leave the room. And my words are on the record. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it's, a, it's a new norm, right? Mm -hmm. So according to a certain UN resolution, uh, if they cannot um, expel our representatives from a UN meeting, mm -hmm. they have to leave the room because I want China and all that, right? But then uh, by tacitly agreeing to remain in the room and for me to finish my talk, mm -hmm. um, it means that um, they don't see this robot as a representative mm -hmm. of Taiwan. It's a rather representing, <laughs> right? Like literally presenting, <laughs> uh, like a PowerPoint presentation um, and of Taiwan. And so uh, I think uh, these norms are now being reinforced by those video conferencing meetings, by immersive realities, extended realities, when everybody is just a rectangle. There is no member seat or observer seat, uh, and so on. And so I think multi-stakeholderism um, is now augmenting multilateralism. And while Taiwan has no seat in the Westphalian uh, arrangement in many organizations, those same organizations are becoming hybrid, mm. like also multi-stakeholder. Uh, and so when I entered the UN Geneva building, um, my robot entered without requiring a passport, mm. bypassing the multilateral norm. But once they're in the Internet Governance Forum that works on the multi-stakeholder norm, and of course we are a stakeholder to the Internet, my, my name card um, actually has no country name on it, but just a domain name. Mm. And, and obviously .tw resolves to my machine, mm. not a machine in Shanghai or in Beijing. Mm. Uh, and so the stakeholder uh, status is undisputed. Um, even if you type this uh, web address from Shanghai or Beijing, it goes to this machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't go to their machine, right? So, so that part is not what's feminine, but it is uh, still multi-stakeholder. And so I think the opportunity is that people will think in a more multi-stakeholder kind of way to tackle truly global problems. Whereas the pandemic is maybe the first truly global problem that has the same level of urgency more or less, mm -hmm. in all countries. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but of course, as you, <clears throat> you just mentioned, um, the infodemic, um, the data norms, um, like um, climate change, all these are also <clears throat> in the same category of truly global problems mm -hmm. that can only be tackled in a multi-stakeholder and instead of just multilateral fashion. Uh, and I think this is a tremendous opportunity for Taiwan. So what is the biggest challenge to, to mm -hmm. switching to this, mm -hmm. to this new, new reality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to, to this new norm, right? Yeah. Uh, I already mentioned, right, if people subscribe to authoritarian intelligence, if people think AI and think the state should know everything, mm -hmm. then this model doesn't have a breathing room mm -hmm. because all the data will be belong to the state. Right. Um, and also, if surveillance capitalism um, expands unchecked, uh, if the um, surveillance capitalists say that uh, they know the people better than the people know themselves, so why bother with people power or collective intelligence? Um, the AI can predict everything. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's little room for the social sector too, right? So basically for the social sector to grow as a sector, we need to think beyond it being the third sector. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise, the, the other two sectors still dominate. Mm -hmm. And for the social sector to work, I think there need to be a tacit understanding that um, there's strength in plurality. Mm -hmm. And if the plurality is the strength, then the social sector maximizes strength mm -hmm. and maximizes the um, communicational uh, 
powers of the various、uh, plural actors, whereas a single state or a single multinational company would、uh, just be more homogeneous. So, if we truly believe plurality is power、uh, and diversity and inclusion are needed, then the social sector need to be the dominant sector.、Mm. So then, I would say that part of the Taiwan model、mm -hmm. as a core element is、mm -hmm. empowering the social sector. Exactly. I、yes. mean, based as、yes. as a、yes. like a conclusion to everything、Definitely. you said. Definitely. You know, in other than the the more tangible、yes. uh, elements, you know about the data and、uh, mm -hmm. how exactly Taiwan is doing to、mm -hmm. fight the pandemic. Yes. But a more abstract but very important element would、mm -hmm. be this empowering the social. Yeah,、sector. I would even say it's the social sector first approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe we call it the zero sector.、No. <laughs> Um, okay, so in light of the growing U.S.-China tension,、mm -hmm. how realistic do you think the prospect that Taiwan could define its future for itself?、Mm -hmm. How realistic do you see、mm -hmm. this, and how can Europe help? Maybe、mm -hmm. that could be our last question.、Mm -hmm. Sure. First of all, I think, as I said, Taiwan offers a third way. Outside of this state knows everything or the companies knows everything dilemma,、mm -hmm. and in this vein, we show every person on the planet really、uh, that you don't need to trade economic growth to public health or the other way, the other way around,、um, and so it's very realistic because we make this argument without alluding. To U.S.-China tension,、mm -hmm. this argument has nothing to do with the U.S.-China tension, and this argument is profoundly universal.、Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm, I'm optimistic about it.、Uh, and how could Euro help? I guess the Europe、um, can be resilient、uh, and hold to the humanistic、uh, tradition、uh, of empowering not only. Individual human dignity, which is what EU is all about anyway,、mm -hmm. uh, but also the social sector. That is to say,、uh, not just individuals' dignity, but individual as association, individual as a unity, individual as unions,、uh, but still plural, like、mm -hmm. many different joint data controllers、mm -hmm. uh, in GDPR parlance.、Uh, and Taiwan has many such data coalitions already. Uh, around、um, Airbox, which is for environmental、um, measurements, the civil IoT system,、um, the、uh, collaborative fact checking system, and so on, and all these are the kind of joint data controllership that GDPR is designed to empower. And so, whereas the EU is still figuring out how to make such data co-op slash unions work,、uh, we already have some working models. So EU can help. By first of all, list us as case studies, and also the other way around. To when we're negotiating for GDPR adequacy, which we are doing so right now, and、um, also think about how the key GDPR clauses can also have a Taiwanese contribution and interpretation.、Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very interesting, and also、mm -hmm. what I find fascinating、mm -hmm. is in Europe the debate about what to do about. Covid nineteen、mm -hmm. or the the pandemic is what、well, it's the economy or human、mm, yeah it, it's, a, it, it's a false dilemma it's a for but it's、uh -huh. so difficult to break、uh -huh. Uh -huh. away from that because yeah, yeah. they will say okay so you close we have a lockdown in many European know, countries now so then the reaction is okay so our economy will suffer、yeah. but but that's not the priority it's、uh -huh. that the Taiwanese priority has always been、uh -huh. to protect human health yes and also to Uh, empower the social sector, namely the community pharmacists that are trusted by the elders,、mm -hmm. and also to make sure our mask rationing are the same experience as renewing chronic、uh, prescriptions、mm -hmm. and so on. So it's with a lot of care put into empowering the existing social relationships because we understand that's the only way that people would voluntarily devise new ideas. Using traditional rice cookers to disinfect the mask、mm. and all that、uh, without any top-down measurement.、Yeah. Mm. Okay, I think we've got we've covered most、yeah. 
most things. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, it was really, really a pleasure to to get access to mm -hmm. you and sure. to to your your views. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, Nine Dash Line yeah. is really trying to to do more to connect Europe uh, with Asia. And mm -hmm. I was wondering if you mm -hmm. if you can refer me to any entity here in in Taiwan in the civil sector mm -hmm. where I that I could connect with with actors mm -hmm. who would be interested in. in sure, Joe jo has the complete list. Yeah, Actually, more is, complete than me. Yes, so. <laughs> maybe he, maybe uh, <coughs> if I approach uh -huh. some some entity. Sure, sure. I you can, can see me. You can see I can see me. you. Yeah, yeah, you, you your can, email. Yeah, yeah, you can see my email. You, Oh, your your <coughs> yeah. You, you have all my three cards, but the same email. Same email. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. We we should do a picture.